Hello and welcome to another edition of the Podium Podcast. I'm Simon Hartley. And I'm Tom May. And over the years, I've heard hundreds, if not thousands of people talking about the power of applying elite sports thinking into business. Um, And I think it's a great concept. I really do. But the question is, how? How do you apply an elite sports mindset into business? During the course of these uh, podcasts, we will be finding out exactly how you do it. We'll be finding out what works and what doesn't. And we're joined by a load of brilliant guests who have all made the transition from the highly competitive world of elite sport into business. Our guest today is no exception. Uh, He's a rugby league legend. So please welcome John Wilkin. John, welcome to the show. Oh, legend. Legend's a bit strong, isn't it? It's, it's, I, don't know how you, I don't know how you make it to legendary status, but um, it's a very flattering introduction. Uh, hyperbolic, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> well, you must definitely be a Saints legend. Um, I'm, I'm, take that. Sure. <laughs> Has to sure. be. <laughs> God, Before we... <laughs> Before we start talking about you sort of transitioning into business, um, can you tell us a little bit about your playing career? I mean, uh, am I right in thinking that other than a little stint at Toronto at the end, you were basically a one-club man? Did you play for Saints from schoolboys and academies all the way through? No, I I went to uh, college over in Hull, so I grew up in Hull. Uh, I was doing my A-levels, and at that time, um, my dad was a big Hull Kingston Rovers fan, I think it had always been a dream of mine to play for Kingston Rovers. And uh, instead of signing professionally, I actually signed semi-professionally and played at the the, the league below, the Super League, uh, just to finish my A-levels because um, I wanted to go to university. So I, I had no real aspiration to sort of play professionally at that stage. So I played in Hull KR for, for two years, came over to Manchester, went to uni. And then I played at St. Helens, signed for St. Helens, played there for 17 seasons, and then he said, as you rightly said, I spent 18 months in Toronto, which was an unbelievable sort of part of my career. You know, when you're winding down, fully winding down, it was a beautiful thing to be in a city like Toronto, just winding down those last months of my career. But the bulk of my career uh, was at St. Helens and something that, you know, I'm, you know, I'm proud of my time there. You mentioned uh, going to university. How how prevalent is, um, is that focus for... for within rugby league because that that's I mean you hear a lot of players talk about it a lot of them sack it sack it off or you know just can't can't cope with the workload how did you find it yeah I mean I always had aspirations to go to uni I didn't aspire to be a professional sportsman you know I didn't want to be a professional rugby player when I was at school you know I enjoyed I enjoyed playing cricket actually I wanted to be a cricketer more than I wanted to be a rugby player um so my focus was always academic, really. Um, but the challenge, you know, I think in rugby league, as, as, as with a lot of sports, is, is balancing a professional career and, and actually, I think, not, not just going to university, but getting the results that you wanted. You know, I quickly found that combining the two was, was very difficult. And just going back to your point, Tom, about rugby league, look, the, the percentage of people who play professional rugby league with a degree would be, you know, in very low percentages you know maybe two three percent of players would have a degree and I remember looking actually in stark contrast to, to rugby union you know your sport Tom and there, there was an awful lot more I think it was more like 20 25 percent around that time so uh, I suppose I was a bit of an anomaly going to going to uni but a very long-winded answer to your question I didn't finish my degree Tom. So, mm. Well you couldn't have told that answer. You can we wouldn't have been able to tell. I think <laughs> I think it's quite interesting, isn't it? I think um, I, I mean I, I went I went to uni and I, and I stuck with it. I like, largely because my dad was sort of on the conservative side, and the messaging I was getting from him was, you know, you could break your leg tomorrow and um, it'll all be over. He was. It's not ideally what you want to be hearing when you when you're embarking on a professional rugby career, but um, I think it provided me with that balance, and I, I think university and studies actually gave me a way to focus on rugby as as many of us start focusing on sport as a as a hobby as something I loved um so actually then going to it and and training felt like I was I was getting away from work which like that and you talk about the balance that's the balance that I I found really beneficial from doing that yeah it's really important I think but balance is such a big big word isn't it I think in life you know, finding balance, uh, um, 
not be completely obsessed by maybe one facet of your life, by just, I think, exploring other opportunities, by having other opportunities in your life. I think that naturally does give you balance. And like I found balance in a lot of my interests away from sport. My sort of academic sort of life was one of those. Uh, I grew up on a farm, so farming, you know, I'm, I'm a pig farmer by trade so farming was an escape for me you know from from that professional sort of sports environment and then as we'll come on to talk to I found another source of balance was business you know and having an interest Mm -hmm. away from sport which probably later on in my career or middle part of my career to later on in my career I found my balance in 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 having my mind or my interests somewhere else than completely obsessed with the career in sport. I think there's only a handful of people in life who can deal with such a narrow focus. You think of like I don't know Roger Federer, you know Cristiano Ronaldo, you know these kinds of characters who are completely obsessed by their sports career, and it works for them. And we use them as examples all the time. It drives me crazy because I think. For the majority of people being that Doesn't obsessed like with that. <laughs> nah, one part of your life, if you're that obsessed with it, it I just think it's unhealthy. And, and so balance, I think Tom's a, a great word that people yeah. should use I, more. I've come across so many athletes over the years who have kind of invested their whole identity into their athletic identity. Um, they only see themselves as an athlete, as a swimmer, as a rugby player or whatever. And this, the uh, kind of prevalence of, of um, pressure that comes with it, you know, the, the amount of pressure that they feel because they've got such a narrow sense of who they are um, is sometimes crushing for them. Um, so I think you're right, having that having that broader sense of who you are and and the, the understanding that you can be successful in more than one area of life. You know, if things don't go right in rugby, it's not the end of the world. You know, to have that view of life, I think, is incredibly helpful. Um, I mean, you, you must have, do, during do the you know, course just, of your just, playing just, career, just, had some real challenges along the way. Because, you know, it's rare that you go, like you say, sort of 12, 10, 12, 13, 14, 15 years in sport without something going wrong. Uh, what were the big challenges that came along your way? I, th- I think um, I think because I started my career and I, w- I wasn't obsessed with being a professional sportsman. So I, th- I found it a real blessing at, at, at the start. So I, I think I went through a period of maybe four, five, six years where I was surpassing my own expectations and surpassing supporters' expectations, the club's expectations. And in that part of my career, that was just like a really joyous part of my career where um, I was just achieving all the time. I think the hardest part of my career where came where expectation and my performance sort of met at the same point, you know, and where there was an expectation of me to perform at a certain level. And realistically, week on week, did I meet that performance? Probably not. And And... I think that was a really interesting point because I reached that maybe five, six years into a professional career. And I think that maybe is the point at which people drop out of sport. Maybe that happens at a much younger age, you know, where you just meet that. It's like a, a plateau of performance and an expectation. You don't quite meet it. Well, I went through that maybe five, six years into my career. So I think that was the toughest thing. Look, in, injuries and, you know, coach changes and all of that stuff. Um was tough but I just embraced that as part of the journey like I loved that I loved the adversity in my career like I I got excited when things got tough and I don't know whether it's because I'm a pikey pig farm from Hull but but, but I started to get excited about my career when things got tough and when 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 people wrote me off you know I got I got a bit between my teeth then and, and, and I found it harder to perform when everything's going well so yeah, I think adversity, I actually found it motivating. You know, I think somebody once said to me, it's like adversity is either like a headwind or it's the wind in your sails. And I tried to view some of those things that were tricky along the way. It's just a wind in my sails rather than just sailing into a headwind all the time. Mm. So that period when you like you say five or six years in and maybe um, you're – the expectations caught up with you now. What did you learn through that period? You know, sort of, how, how did you get through it? What did you learn from it? One thing 
I think Tom will probably understand this. I think you're your own harshest critic, aren't you? Like when you play a sport, you're really cruel to yourself, actually. you Nobody could ever criticise your own performance more than you've criticised it yourself. And, and one thing I did realise is that you're never as good or bad as you think you are. You know, if you've right. been great, you're never that good. You were never that good. And if you've been bad, you're never as bad as you want to make out. So I think through that part of my career, I just learned to be emotionally really stable with with my performances, with with life, um, and and not not worry too much about about things, and just trust maybe the process of training hard, working hard, being professional. Um, but it's not it's not. I mean, I'm post rationalising and saying that's how I dealt with it. I think if I look back to my career when it was happening, it it wasn't particularly nice sort of place to be. But as we all know, you know, you've got to be in those dark spots to get out. And, 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 and you know, I played another 12 years after that. Uh, mm. So, yeah, I certainly did, did a lot of learning. I think combining your last two points, you talk about adversity and then, and then also how, how good you are or, or, in fact, you weren't on any particular given day. Um, it's, it's those processes that I think that I, I probably didn't realise it at the time, but they they sort of drove me emotionally so i i was i was always going through my career thinking i'm not quite sure i never really believed that i should have been in the environment i was in um or i was good enough to be in that environment you go into an england squad and you sort of look around and go oh my god there's no way i should be in here um and i guess i guess that's why and I, and i did some work with with simon and i was growing up i was a horrible little pain in the ass when I was when I was coming through the ranks and and, and it was almost like I had to sort of, to front up like chest out and be be this thing that I wasn't um because I was inside I was fighting that sort of that that inner demon that was going you were terrible last week or this week you were quite good but you need to be better and it's all that that sort of internal pressure that that it sort of comes together as some sort of internal concoction that, that led to being me being a horrible little little thing but um i think um i think coming back coming back to your adversity point it's those it's those tough days when you think right what 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 are my choices here do i just roll over and give up or and that's just that's just not even an option so the only other thing is get up and go even harder the same way um and i think i think i've had a, i've had a conversation recently with with, with simon and and uh, and Justin, one of the one of the team here at, at Podium Podcast, and and it, it, that's happened to me recently in work life. You know, I've taken a hammering, and it's like you know, I was all like, whoa, and then it's like, right, okay, refocus, and and you know, I'll show you type thing. I think it's quite an interesting um, interesting ingredient that sports people bring to the sort of corporate business world. Yeah, it's a robustness, isn't it? Like a, a resilience and a, a toughness. But I think because what we do, what we did, Tom, was we dealt with adversity almost in an irregular amount of times. You know, when you're getting into mm. sport, it kicks you around. From day one, it kicks you around. And look, to, to be a good junior player, then to be become a sort of semi-professional player, you need to have, you know, ridden out some adversity. Then And then at that stage, it gets tough again. And then you have to ride that out. And then you get into your career and then you get injured, you get dropped, you don't make the national team, so it kicks you around, and then you keep going. And I'm like, well, that's life, isn't it? That's just, that's everybody's life, though. You know, I speak to yeah. my dad about stuff. I speak to my dad all the time because my dad's like a gnarly, passive-aggressive pig farmer. You know, he's not left. He still lives in Hull now. He's not left. He's never left. He's emotion emotional box you know he's a sealed but he that's just how he lives his life like he just gets on with stuff he just cracks on and and, yeah. and i think one thing he taught me was when when life slaps you about a bit you just crack on just get on with it like you can yeah. like you said tom it's two choices in it you either be like my passive dog that i've got when you walk in it rolls over to get its belly scratched or you get after it, and I, and I always yeah. found when it got tough, I wanted to get after it, and I don't know mm. whether that came from my dad, or whether it came from just a long sort of process of not being quite good enough. Tom, what you said there is that imposter sort of syndrome where you're always thinking I'm not quite there. I think it's probably a combination of my dad and also thinking I'm not quite good enough. What am I doing here? That just drives mm. you on daily. 
I think mine came from having massive small man syndrome as well, but that's another issue. <laughs> we're, all, we're, all, we're, all the, we're all the same, all the same size on here. <laughs> yeah, on here. Yeah, it's brilliant, yeah. There I'm stood go. on eight I'm stood on eight <laughs> eight, eight boxes. <laughs> Come down like this. Just actually on, on that one, uh, um First, first time uh, I met John, uh, it was over in the Lake District. I think uh, Saints were over there doing a pre-season thing, and uh, Tom Yill had done the same thing, climbing over hay bales and pushing tractor tires around, flinging them about, and carrying these big jerry cans of water. And there was there was one exercise, a piggyback race up this hill, and you know, like most hills, feel like they're getting steeper. This one seriously actually did get steeper. And I don't know who did the pairing. John must have seriously annoyed somebody the day before, but most lads were paired with somebody their own height. I can't remember who you were paired with, John. I reckon it might have been Louis McCarthy Scarsbrook or somebody. He was about uh, three times as big. No. I know exactly who it was, Simon. It was Joe Greenwood. He was just six foot five, hundred and twelve kilos. <laughs> and I was I, I'm six foot eighty-five, eighty-six kilos. So it was just it was a long hill. It was a very long hill. In fact, <laughs> speak about speak about adversity. I, I should have listed that. Actually, that was nearly the point which I retired. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, a- anything that was be- anything that was beyond fifty meters, I nearly retired. <laughs> very, quick, very, very, yeah. quick, very quick over fifty. I seriously remember watching them I think, all start. Uh, you go, but you took. Remember watching them all start, and and I was thinking they are going to no, call the I'm air sorry. ambulance in a minute. <laughs> I think, and look, you talk about pre-seasons. That's where, that's where, um, so people always say to me, oh, you know, what are the highlights of your career, this, that, and the other. It's really easy to go, uh, like it's an individual achievement or something like that. But actually, the, well, I found winning, winning the two cups that we won with Newcastle, the best things, because you, you put in such a horrific amount of work during pre-season to get to a point to achieve something. And you can actually look back at all those stupid things you're told to do <laughs> and go oh well maybe it was worth it you know like uh, you know we're back in the day when you sort of have to go All right we're going to go into the woods and we're going to make a uh, a camp out of this bit of rope and those twigs over there and that's going to make you a better team uh, and all the lads are like no it's, it's really not but maybe it did that one year that's it's, it's one of those oh, things you, no. again you, you just get on with it <laughs> No, it definitely doesn't. It definitely doesn't. It has nothing to do. It's the most non-specific training method of all time. Right, what we're going to do is take a group of lads, put them in a marine camp, and that's going to make them a better rugby league team. It doesn't work. It it just serves to antagonise people. But oh, it's just I'll get just just quickly what one story about that. Well, I remember pulling into um, into one of the. Uh, Otterburn is that is that a camp up in the north northeast? Yeah, yeah. Simon yeah. probably it's Otterburn the border, up there somewhere, the isn't it? Border. And we were all sort of we, we all had like we all had backpacks next to us and stuff, and we were like, oh yeah, we've got this covered. I've got loads of rations tucked away. Suddenly, these sort of marines popped up along this sort of driveway, and they started firing blanks at us. Now the <laughs> the driver opened the door. You've never you've never seen twelve blokes leave a van quickly, and all. Everyone just left their bags and you just start running up this field. And it was like, they've done us. They've completely done us. And all we had was everything that we were wearing. And we were running up this, I thought some sort of fell. It was just like, oh my, you know, they've, they've had us hook, line and sink. It was too terrible. Three days on the run, basically. Made us a better team though. Yeah. <laughs> and and this, this is the interesting thing because mm, like I say, the, there's some, some people would say that makes you a better team or that makes you a better athlete or whatever. And of course, corporates do these things as well. They run off and build camps and shelters and expect to come back a better team too. So I'm, I'm really interested to know kind of what what out of your uh, experience, John, does apply into business, what doesn't. First of all, can you tell us about the business, about Pot Kettle Black and about the bakery? Because, you know, these things have got nothing to do with rugby. You know, you've, you've started businesses that were nothing to do with rugby. So can you tell us a little bit about them, first of all, and what the spark of inspiration was? Well, yeah, I started... Uh, my own business in 2008, uh, I, I had a, a, a catering company that we delivered in a van to offices in um, in Warrington. That was my first business. And that was sort of my first foray into having a business. And, I, you know, I kind of started to enjoy things. And then 2014, I was playing with a guy called Mark Flanagan, who'd been to Australia, came back sort of 
waxing lyrical about their coffee culture and, and and he said oh we should do this casual dining brunch is a big thing over there back in 2014 when we set up the business brunch really probably wasn't a thing you know um it wasn't as common as it is now um so we set up a, a cafe um and we expanded it grew it did really well we, we set up another one we've got three now and sort of a byproduct of that through lockdown actually we during lockdown we had to pivot because all the cafes were closed so we started baking wholesale selling our sort of baked goods bread pastries and the bakeries just flying like the bakeries is a bigger part of the business now as the cafes so we've done incredibly well but it's yes it's a complicated business we've got um 85 staff um you know some real challenges with price increases and, and consumer spending habits and you know all of these things, but but I said a business that I'm incredibly proud of, Simon, and something mm. that we, we we work hard at. You know, sort of every day. You know, How did I, you find the um, during COVID when you when you had to when you had to think quickly on your feet? Did that did that did that scare you, or did you think did you see that as an opportunity? Yeah, like I suppose we're going to talk about what you've drawn from your sporting career, and and I think. It, uh, you know that point is just get up and get after it again you know there was a temptation just to pause and see what's going to happen well what I find when you've got such tight deadlines and maybe your cash supplies are dwindling it really focuses your mind on coming up with some strategy really quickly and and you know we knew we could open the bakery we could keep the bakery up and everybody else was shutting down taking furlough was taking the grants and the government help we made a conscious decision to not do that with the bakery keep it alive keep trading through the lockdown and as a result we've picked up maybe 25 30 customers so you know that lockdown tom was was scary because it was just such an unknown thing wasn't it you know you, when it started covid started you saw like oh, it'll be a few months maybe six months you know and we'll just sort of roll in and out of these little lockdowns sort of casually that first lockdown was brilliant wasn't it the sun was out you know me and the wife were having a glass of rosé you know you're in the garden oh, drinking rosé rosé like, consumption wow. went like that didn't it, <laughs> it was insane. <laughs> so i was like this is like a mini holiday but all in the you know in the background obviously business was was carnage and, and look we got through it and there's a lot of businesses that didn't survive that um it was an incredibly tough period tom but but i reckon in life you very rarely get the chance to stop and pause nothing happened and in in lockdown nothing happened and i was like the business stopped we opened seven days a week we were closed and the clarity of thought that came from that was just yeah. incredible it's like this fog had just disappeared and i was like right you know me and my business partner were like right this is what we've got to do we've got to get this bakery going we've got to like get after wholesale customers we've got to do this and the cloud of day-to-day -day life sometimes just blurs your vision and i thought lockdown gave me some clarity you know and that i found it really useful actually tom on, you know retrospectively for the business it's been a huge help for us mm. and tom and i have actually um one of the things we've reflected on in the past is that you know being an elite sport you've got to get that sort of uh, that learning cycle really tight you, you know you learn from one week to the next you, you're out again next saturday next sunday friday night whatever and you're back in front of the crowd and you're performing and so you've got to learn and adjust and, and respond really quickly. And I guess, you know, lockdown was the same for many people. Lot, lots of people took a long time to get their heads around it. And some people got up the next day and, and sort of think, we need to do something. What are we going to do? Um, so and do you think that sort of that understanding from elite sport helped you to pivot more quickly or pick up the mantle again more quickly? Yeah, that, that, that feedback cycle that you're in in sport all the time is is performance, feedback, analysis, review, perform again. It's such a quick cycle, isn't it? It doesn't exist in, in everyday life. You know, baffles me the business world sometimes that the feedback process is so slow. And, and, and one of my big challenges is actually adapting the way I feed back into my business because things in, in, in everyday life, and I'd say many of my staff's lives, it's not such a quick feedback process that they're after. Um, yeah, I think that really helped. And also, I really do think, like, deep-rooted in my DNA is is get up and get after it, you know, and, and 
what what the opportunity I think there was two things to do is, is we, we could just just wait and see what happens, get all the help we could, or we could be ambitious. And I was like, well, what, what are we doing here? Let's be ambitious. Like, if we're going to do anything now, let's do something bold. Let's let's do something that nobody else is doing. And, and we just, I think underpinning our philosophy in, 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 in what we do with the business is, is just... It's, getting after opportunities, whatever they might be, you know, and, 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 and not be scared to say yes to things and, and mm-hmm. do diff- make difficult decisions. But if we're going to make decisions, we make them quickly. And I think that's one thing COVID taught me is sometimes a quick decision just gets the, it gets the ship moving in a certain direction. And you can always change course once you're moving, but it's much better than being static, in, in my opinion. Yeah. I think one of the things that it's probably, it's probably said in rugby league as well is, you know, someone makes a poor decision. They've made a decision. Your teammates, if you get after it, you can turn a poor decision into a good one by just yeah. by just just all chasing down that channel and and you know making sure that you can you either pressure the, pressure the other team into making a mistake and therefore it becomes a good decision or whatever it might be. But if you all follow that path, no matter whether it's good or bad, you can turn it into a positive. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's exactly the same in in, in rugby league. I think. Yeah, you've got the opportunity to just get moving and get something done. And, and I favour that in life every time over s- s- just standing still and, and just, just assessing where you're at. I think even if you you are moving in the wrong direction, like you said, if there has been a mistake, you know, at least you've got momentum behind you in some sort of direction. I find it easy to change course business-wise if we're already travelling in a certain direction. In fact, I actually think it's easier to flip back and go the other way when you're actually moving in a certain direction than when you stood still. Because when you stood still, everything's possible. So for business, we could have just waited and then we could have gone in any direction possible where we said, right, we're going to grow the bakery. We just started moving. And that just gave us focus, clarity, purpose. It, it I think, funneled everybody behind us like as the spearheads of the business and just gave them some something to focus on too so it was a lockdown was tough but a really it was really fruitful for our business mm. one of the things i've noticed from chatting to you know hundreds and hundreds of entrepreneurs is the entrepreneurial journey is not an easy one i don't think i've ever found anybody who said yeah yeah piece of cake this entrepreneurship's lark um in particular what have you found toughest about entrepreneurship it was there anything you p- felt completely unprepared for even coming out of elite sport um, yeah, I think the sense of responsibility for other people, you know, as a business owner, we've got staff, I've got 85 people who are higher and um, probably made acutely was it aware of it during lockdown is my responsibility as an employer to these people, you know, how much they relied upon me when in a career in professional sport, look, you rely on your teammates and you've got a club and, and, and all that, but it's different when livelihoods depend on your decisions and what you do. And I think one of the biggest things I struggle with is, is, is just making peace with that, you know, my employment or the jobs that we provided were that important to people. And I think that was a, something that I, I, str- not I struggled with. I just felt a heavy burden of responsibility and especially through COVID um, because in professional sport, you've got guys around you you know, with exceptions are from means, you know, or have a, yeah. a large disposable sort of income. They've got a good salary. Whereas, you know, I was working with people who are, are on just above minimum wage, who were renting a flat in Manchester, who who need to work. If they don't get their money, they're getting thrown out, you know, and there's different consequences, you know, and the consequences I was facing was actually the harsh realities of life for my staff. And I think yeah. the burden of responsibility is the owner of the business. I, I struggled with that, or, or not struggled, I tussled with it a lot mentally of, of, of where, where I sat. Because there's one way, ruthless, is just do what you need to do for the business, you know, stamp people down, get rid of people, keep it lean, push it forward. Or that sort of didn't sit right morally with us. So we just went, mm-hmm. we'll do what we can to look after people here. And whether that's the right or wrong call, I don't know. There's somebody... There'll be some finance boff in some bean counter somewhere telling me that's a ridiculous thing to do. But I think, you know, it's the way we like to do things. No boffins on here. (laughs) (laughs) Certainly no bean counters. (laughs) We can't even count, never mind beans. (laughs) I thought it was four of us on here one minute ago. (laughs) (laughs) 
Yeah, it, it's it's interesting because you, you're right. People think of uh, elite sport as a very high pressure environment, but what you're talking about is a very different kind of pressure. You feel it in a different way, don't you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, and I think as well. Look, I think with a career in, in sport, you the burden of responsibility is on yourself. It's very personal. You can prepare yourself. You know individually what you've done to prepare. Um, and and you're around other competent professional people who are all preparing in a very similar way. So there's a lot of comfort comes from that. You know, when you go into a business, you know you the, you know you just at the in the hands of customers, climate, weather, you know, changes in in you know like for us in the culinary like zeitgeist, what's popular, what's not. You know, you there's a lot of factors that you just can't control and, and and like I said without going back to COVID all the time look global pandemic it's, there's nothing we could do to control any of that yeah. uh, whereas in sport I feel like you're much more in control of performance and output in business because I'm not operationally working there all the time you know it's mm-hmm. difficult to have that same sense of control so the biggest lesson that I think I've learned is relinquishing control to people who you trust and, and giving trust and autonomy to people who you work with to go and do the thing without constantly having an eye over the shoulder, without micromanaging people, is get good people and then let them do what they do without too much scrutiny or attention uh, and just, just look after them. And that's been my sort of leadership business style is, is that kind, caring, compassionate. And, and my job is to support and look after my staff, not, not to sort of dictate how things are done. Yeah. Is that very kind of different? Because obviously as a, as a senior player, when you're captain side, you're a leader. Um, but is it another dimension of leadership for you? Yeah, I, I always, I, I don't know. I, I think I've, I've not always led from the front. I know that sounds weird. I, I was, I think when I was a player, I, would, I became captain of the team because I was that guy who would be, sort of empathetic who would reach out to people who would bring everybody together I would tie up a lot of loose ends on the field I would do a lot of things that other people maybe didn't want to do and through that that became my leadership style it's more of a supportive style than a you know one of those leaders that's like got an axe and a shield and sprinting to the front of the queue to like get into battle I I don't necessarily see myself as ever being like that so in some ways the transition into business and the leadership in business it, it although it was different and very different because it's just the difference of the people that you're dealing with. It felt very natural for me to support a large group of people and speak to a large group of people and give clarity to a large group of people. Um, I think that, you know, the biggest thing I took from sport is leadership that I've taken into my business, you know, not performance. It's the leadership and the leadership qualities that that I've really, I use every day, every single Mm -hmm. day. Mm, yeah brilliant is is there anything that you've learned from business that either whilst you were playing you applied back into your sort of sports performance or you think could be you know in hindsight you think sport could almost learn from business yeah i think well i think business and sport uh, you know i think business is fascinated by sport isn't it you know i think it's it's looks to learn a huge amount of lessons from sport I think there's obviously some things that translate well across, but you know if you look at big business, I think sport can learn an awful lot from that, can't it? The 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 organisation of it, I think mm. the the sort of blue sky, big thinking of you know how things are done, innovation, you know, in in that would be the big one. How that happens? I think yeah. that would be the big one for me. Looking at sport, I think at, speaking for my own sport. Um, and probably other sports, there's a there's a very there's an inclination to stay with tried and tested, um, whether it be from oh we're very traditional value you know valued sport and all this sort of stuff. Um, I just think there are so many opportunities that sports as a as a general are missing or, or clubs are missing because they they're like no we do it like this because this is what. This is what we do in our sport. There's not really a huge amount of thinking outside that box, and it takes something I've I've learned from um, from uh, the CEO of the of the company I'm working for now. He's like, 
you'll only get change from someone coming in from the outside. You're not going to get change from within. And it's quite interesting looking at different sports and how how it's always the same sort of people that end up in and around those teams or within the unions. It's like, well, nothing ever changes here. Um, and so, and I think that could revitalize sport in so many ways. And like, I think cricket's probably probably changed itself more than any other sport over the over the recent years. The way it's now engaging with a far different audience from from Test match cricket to to one day cricket to twenty twenty to to the hundred now. I think it's it's amazing how they've got a, a full suite of offering for for every sort of cricket fan. You know, how can other sports open that up to, you know, to the masses? And actually, how can it be a an interest point where it doesn't have to actually be a fan that's watching it? Yeah. Uh, I think that's one thing that w- when I was when I, we always used to play on Sundays or or Saturdays, um, and I used to love watching the Super League um, as we we're in our in our sort of team hotel on a Friday night. And I always used to see that back in the day when it was on Sky on a Friday night, and it'd be like this is actually an event. You know, there's all sort of the razzmatazz around it. They pick some really dirty trance music to go with to go with the uh, <laughs> go with the promos, which I always love. Uh, and I just thought this is awesome. You know, like, this is what it should always be about: be about the event, not just the eighty minutes, the, the sort of yeah. the bookended eighty minutes of, of the sport. That innovation piece that you just mentioned, I think, is so so important. Yeah, and I think one one thing that I learned from from business as well is 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 the importance of cognitive diversity of like just divergence sort of thoughts you know I think Matthew Said wrote you know a couple of great books about this but, but cognitive diversity for me is something that after I read um after I read the, the book I, I realized that that's something in sport that you just don't get a lot of cognitive diversity you get a lot of guys who are entrenched their views in a certain particular way and then that is Tom, like you said, it makes it very difficult for things to change when everybody sees things the same way. One one thing that's beautiful about food and drink and being in food and drink is there's quite a transient group of staff. You know, they come and go, but you meet so many different people. I've worked with a we work with a 50 year old Portuguese guy. I've got a 17 year old A level student. We've got everything in between, and 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 he, listening to that diversity of thought about the business actually they make all the decisions of where we're going sometimes i just listen to what they have to say and i think in sport quite often we we project a lot and sports project a lot but forget to listen and especially to external feedback tom i couldn't agree more like external feedback actually gets sort of scorn it's a bit like well you know sour grapes you know if there's a critique comes in about your sport um, I think we're resistant to hearing it, which is ironic because sports built on feedback. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely, brilliant, John. That's absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Before we close, uh, Tom's got some quick fire questions. So uh, over to you, Tom. Yeah, there are four questions are we bang out at the end of every every podcast. So the first one: If you hadn't been a professional athlete, what would you have been? And is there another vocation that took your interest? Well, I didn't finish my geography degree, so I think I would have gone into maybe town planning or something off the bat. I don't even know. What do you do with a geography degree? I have no idea. So I'd have been a pig farmer, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> or a geography okay. teacher. Uh, who is it? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, who's the person you most admire in sport and in business? Oh, the person I most admire in sport... God, that's such a tough question, isn't it? Um, I think a lot of what I read about Pep Guardiola, um, you know, his, his, his mentality and his philosophy from Barcelona to, to Man City, I love the way he speaks to his players. I think very rarely do words come out of his mouth that he doesn't think about or mean exactly what he says. Uh, so I think in, in a sports sense, yeah, Pep Guardiola, for, for sure. In a business sense, that's, yeah, that's, that's a tricky one. It's a tricky one. I'll have to come back to you on that. There's so many, isn't there? There's so many yeah. big, sort of huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, yeah. Um, if someone's someone's given you a wad of cash to invest in something, what would it be? What would you invest in? Uh, wearable tech. Oh, I think some sort of wearable tech. Whether it's you know, I don't know. There's, there's businesses out there, but you know, this where you're 
your watch now is integrated with your iPhone, you know, your clothing is now giving you feedback. There's got to be an iteration or development of that. So I'm going to sit on the cash, Tom, for now. I'm just going to wait for the next tech tech genius to develop like some sort of <laughs> smart fabric that reads your heart rate and gives you feedback straight away. Where did global, what was it, global hypercolour go? The ones that just told you you were getting sweaty and hot. And they just changed, didn't they? <laughs> just, Do you remember them? That must have been the first just, wearable tech. Just two, <laughs> two. Massive discs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's a bit hot and sweaty. He's definitely oh. wearing wearable tech in. Um, you can only, <laughs> you can only watch one film for the rest of your life. What would it be? Oh, uh, Groundhog Day. <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh, I love it. He's he's thought outside the box there, and he's yeah. coming with an absolute belter. <laughs> there will be no one else in that series, this series, that comes back with that answer. <laughs> love it. Brilliant, well done, top man. <laughs> that's that's fantastic. Yeah, I think you've uh, you've nailed the points for that round. To be quite honest, um, brilliant. Uh, thank you very much, Tom May. Thank you very very much, John Wilkin. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Uh, we will see you on the very next episode of the Podium Podcast. Take care. John shared a myriad of really great insights with us, but there were a couple that stuck out for me. Firstly, he talked about the importance of having balance and not getting overly obsessed with one area or aspect of our life. And when we have this balance, it's likely that we'll also be able to realise that we are neither as good or as bad as we think. Secondly, he talked about adversity and how you can either see it as a headwind or the wind in your sails. And I suspect if you see it as the wind in your sails, you'll also be able to do something else that John talked about which is when things do get tough we can get up and go again or as John says when life slaps you around you can get up crack on and get after it